This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 749, recorded on April 29th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. How's this week been, Daniel? Things are getting a little bit better, to be honest, at least here in New York. Um, you know, it's a little painful when I look at it, how things are going in the world. But uh, let's let's get right into it, uh, because our quotation ties this together. Uh, there are two kinds of guilt, the kind that drowns you until you're useless and the kind that fires your soul to purpose. And this is by Saba Tahir, a Pakistani American author. Um, and right, right into uh, that question, Vincent, that you asked me, how are things going? Um, here in the United States and most of the United States, we've really started to uh, <clears throat> come off of that plateau. Uh, numbers are going down. Um, we look at the numbers of patients in the hospitals here in, um, in the New York State, um, and it's about 60% lower than it was a month ago. So that's really coming down. Um, it's often several days um, that I go without a uh, patient with COVID dying, actually. So this is really, uh, really changing the landscape. We are not where we were um, in April of 2020. We're in April of 2021. Um, and it was just announced that July 1st, New York City is going to be full full open, 100% across the board. So um, I think that we are seeing um, that vaccines are not just a tool, they're the nuclear option. They really are, are a game changer. And we'll be talking a little bit about that today. Um, but things are not things are not going well around the world. I mean, around the world, the cases are rising, the deaths are rising. Um, we are still really in the middle of the pandemic. So um, this is why I sort of use this quotation as um, as a exciting as it is here in the U.S. I know personally, I feel a sort of sense of guilt, um, you know, seeing how much other people are suffering and, you know, and, and not wanting to say, let that make you feel useless. Let's, let's all be asking ourselves, what can we do to reach out now to the rest of the world now that I think we're really on our own path here? Um, so children and COVID. Um, I mentioned, I promised last time that I would spend some time uh, talking about camp guidance. And we now have the CDC updated guidance for operating youth and summer camps during COVID-19. Um, so just, you know, you can Google away CDC um, summer camp and, and get this um, really informative uh, resource here. Um, when I was when I was younger, uh, people don't know that I was once younger. I was um, my middle daughter Eloise. Actually, I think looks a bit like I did when I was younger, except she's a lot better looking than I ever was. Um, I used to work as a camp counselor at Camp Jabberwocky, um, and this was a camp out on one of the islands off the coast of Massachusetts for uh, children with cerebral palsy, spina bifida, Down syndrome, other challenges. Um, and I think, you know, I look back on the time that I spent there, and I think if we all take a moment, um, we, we realize how important camp is for so many reasons, for so many um, different individuals. And to sort of take an expression of my daddy, who says, every vacation you don't take is a vacation you will never take. Um, and every summer, our kids don't have an opportunity to go to summer camp. That, that's gone. That, that summer camp opportunity is gone. So <clears throat> I've been doing quite a bit um, pro bono work. I'm, I think I'm starting to push it with my wife. She's starting to say I need to stop doing so much of that. But I really think that this is um, a critical area. And so I've been trying to do my part to help um, with a number of camps get set up for summer. Um, but let's go through what is the CDC telling us um, and what can we think about for the summer for our children, for our grandchildren, depending on where we are in life. So the CDC states that fewer children have gotten sick with COVID-19 compared with adults during the pandemic. Children can be infected with the virus that causes COVID-19, so that's SARS-CoV-2. Um, they can get sick with COVID-19. They can spread the virus to others and they can have severe outcomes. Um, now, I think this is an important starting point. Children are at lower risk, but they are not at no risk. Um, the CDC has a lot of recommendations about how we are keeping our kids safe or how we can keep our kids safe. 
they recommend that each camp um, have an emergency operations plan in place um, to protect the staff, to protect the campers, the families, and then the communities. Remember, these camps operate in um, areas which are often not as heavily populated as other parts. So if you bring COVID into these areas, you're not you're not just exposing the kids and everyone else, you're exposing the community. There should be some minimum um, features in these plans. And um, a lot of the camps, I have to say, are, are getting these plans up. A lot of them are actually fully in place, right? Because uh, probably expecting money from the parents at this point. So they want to be able to have meetings and actually we had one last night, it went till, uh, well, well after eight o'clock. Um, first, we met ahead of time to go over our plans. Um, and then we spent over an hour with the parents answering questions. And so what are the topics that should be in this emergency plan? Um, one, and this is number one, um, the CDC is, is saying, number one, strongly encourage vaccination for all eligible people. Um, as I mentioned, this, this is a game changer. Um, we are seeing that the vaccines are more effective in real life than even we were hoping um, when we saw the initial exciting um, studies. Um, the other health screening for symptoms and diagnostic or screening testing. So testing um, should be a part of the plan. That's number two right after vaccine, testing. Um, and uh, maybe we'll get into this a little more, but uh, the government is working with the states um, and providing testing um, opportunities for the camps, actually supplying testing uh, in that huge, you know, two trillion dollar bill that went through use multiple layers prevention strategies so we're still going to see masking in certain situations we're still going to see physical distancing we're going to see cohorting and cohorting is a nice way to break this down so that if there is an issue it's not the entire camp you're you're keeping it um you're keeping it sort of contained. Um, and then also a focus on the housing arrangements. Um, and, and I think it's great, right up front, improved ventilation. Um, I think we've been trying to talk about the fact that, you know, even though this is a respiratory droplet spread, a respiratory virus, if you take an indoor space, if you don't have ventilation, you start building up, you start building up that six feet away is not gonna protect you in an area with poor ventilation. Think about kids sleeping together in these cabins uh, with their staff. Um, they also want you to start thinking about the fact that not everyone's risk is the same. So think about campers and staff that might have um, higher risks. Um, really a big push to promote outdoors. I kind of like this, spending about 20 years of my life out in Colorado to see that, you know, the CDC now is recommending, uh, you know, promoting outdoor and lower risk activities. Um, so, you know, I, I know people love that, that singing in the mess hall. Let's get that singing outdoors. Traveling to and from, you want to be thinking about that. You don't want to be creating exposure events on the way to the camp. You also want to think about um, on the way off. Uh, cleaning, they mentioned, right? We're getting sort of down here. Remember, cleaning was number one in the olden days. We're realizing this is, not, this is something you get by breathing, not necessarily touching. Keep washing those hands. Um, and then they go on to basically um, go through a lot of other things, including where they finish with have a plan in case someone gets um, COVID-19, have a plan um, in case someone tests positive. And there's two sides as I'm gonna say, if you get a positive test, if you're doing a lot of testing, you're gonna get false positive. So have a plan. How do I quickly verify to see if this is true? How do I respond to those? So um, we're getting great guidance here from the CDC on how to do this safely. We will have a layer where the states are gonna have individual um, guidance and actually mandates for how camps are gonna operate. They're gonna give us specific numbers on if you're cohorting, how big are those cohorts allowed to be? What should be the ratio? Um, so I think that's gonna help here. But um, I think the message here is that we can do this safely. Again, just like the schools, it can also be done unsafely. So ask, ask your camp, what are your plans? Are you planning on following CDC guidance? Are you planning on keeping my kids safe? Because as I keep reiterating, children are certainly at lower risk, but they're not at no risk. Pre-exposure period. Um, this has been an exciting week. Uh, CDC has really been out there this week. And on April 27th, the CDC came out with its when you've been fully vaccinated, how to protect yourself and others guidance. Um, and I'm actually gonna be, well, I think by the time this drops, I'll already talked about this on the news. Um, this 
fear of normal. How do we get back to normal and how can this happen? Um, so what did, what did the CDC have to say? The first, let's define what does it mean as per the CDC to be fully vaccinated? And they're using, just to keep it simple, a two weeks. They're saying two weeks after you finish your vaccine. So two weeks after you did that two dose Moderna Pfizer, two weeks after your J&J. &J. Um, people have probably known I kind of like four weeks after the J&J, &J, but I won't break ranks with the CDC on this one. Um, but this is not the day. This is not the night of your vaccine. Vaccines take a little time. So take that time. Let your body build up those T cells, those B cells, that, that immune protection. And then what can you do? If you're fully vaccinated, um, as per the CDC, they're saying you can gather indoors with fully vaccinated people without wearing a mask. Um, that's pretty exciting. Um, you can gather indoors um, with unvaccinated people and they're, and they're saying without masks, they're, they're talking about staying six feet apart. Um, and they're also throwing in here, you wanna be careful if there's someone there who has increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19. Then, and I, I like this part, you can gather or conduct activities outdoors without wearing a mask, um, except in certain crowded settings and venues, right? So really doubling down on what we've learned. Um, if you are vaccinated, you are at much lower risk. If you're outdoors, right, that risk is about 20 fold higher than indoors. Um, so we're starting to see um, things coming back. If you travel the United States, as per the CDC, you do not need to get tested before or after travel or self-quarantine. Remember, this is for the fully vaccinated. Um, they do make some comments about international travel. Um, really, the U.S. isn't going to put a lot of onus on you. You're going to be needing to look at what international um, destination you might be traveling to. Um, what should you keep doing um, for now if you're fully vaccinated, right? I think there was a wonderful uh, uh, beer commercial um, where the guy's all excited. He's, he's getting his vaccine and then he's going to, you know, go to the bar and do all these other things. Well, what do they want you to keep doing? Um, they say you should still protect yourself and others in many situations um, by wearing a mask that fits snugly. So let's say you're indoor uh, public setting, um, there's a large number of people. There's gonna be unvaccinated people, including children, they point out, um, from multiple households. So you really still, you're still gonna be wearing your mask in certain circumstances. You're visiting indoors with an unvaccinated individual who's at increased risk. Um, we're saying, boy, vaccination really makes you much lower risk of transmitting to others. It does not make you no risk. And in this case, if the stakes are high, um, they say you should still be avoiding those indoor large gatherings. You, you don't wanna go to that packed um, facility yet. Um, some point, maybe that will come. Um, and also, as we know, they still have a mass requirement if you travel. So even if you're fully vaccinated, you're still re required to wear a mask when you're on a plane, on a bus, on a train, um, other, other public transportation. Um, they still want you to watch out for symptoms, right? As we've seen, we do see breakthrough symptoms. Um, fully vaccinated people can still get COVID-19. So if you have symptoms, you're still gonna go. Don't stop testing. You're still gonna go get tested. And so I encourage everyone to go to the CDC site, really look through this. Um, for some people, it's gonna take a little time. I think other people just, you know, jump in the deep end of the pool and, and they're good to go. Um, I, for, for one, I, I will mention, I have a little trepidation. I still have a fear of normal. It's gonna take me a little time um, to ease back into things, even though I am fully vaccinated. Transmission. Um, I always like to have a section where I push people's buttons and get some, uh, some criticism. So this will be it. Um, you know, in many ways, I think going through the camp and the vaccinated guidance really helps us to, um, to answer a lot of the questions about transmission. People are not, I think, as focused on, you know, the words as they are on really understanding different circumstances and how to behave and how to be safe in those um, situations. Um, and I actually, you know, step out here and say, I think there was a disservice done early on with the whole, is it airborne discussion? Um, and then, and perhaps the immortal words of Roxanne Comsey, maybe these will now become immortal. Uh, headline of one of her pieces, they say coronavirus isn't airborne, but it's definitely born by air. 
the word airborne means different things to different scientists and that confusion needs to be addressed. Um, just, I always like to sort of um, bring this back around again. Surfaces are low risk. Remember, lots of hygiene theater, way too much bleach. Uh, maybe one in every 10,000 cases came from surfaces. Outdoors, much safer than indoors about 20 fold safer masks are effective for the wearer and those around us air exchange is critical for indoor risk time matters and it is cumulative for exposures vaccines are not just tools as we're seeing they are really the nuclear option for ending the pandemic and once people are fully vaccinated once we get a larger percentage of our population fully vaccinated um, things do change things do really change in a positive way all right, testing, never miss an opportunity to test. Um, you know, in, as we talked about the camps, as you saw, number two right after vaccination was testing. Um, so I wanna keep reinforcing, um, you know, we've seen a lot of publications on this. Um, I had one out there with uh, some of my colleagues at UHG um, and testing is a critical part of this multi-layered approach to opening camps, schools, businesses and other venues. Um, we should be doing more, not less testing. We are doing less testing, to be honest. Um, the data is, is really compelling here. Um, and one of the things that is compelling is we want more frequent, so frequent testing, um, rapid results. We want to avoid those resulting delays. Um, test With testing, more is better. All right, active vaccination. Um, this has been a busy, busy area never miss an opportunity to vaccinate and never waste a vaccine dose. Um, we're starting to get to the point here in the US, it's like throwing away food, right? Don't, don't throw that dose in the trash, let's get it in someone's arm. Um, we've definitely shifted here in the US and I'm seeing this firsthand from arms searching for vaccines to vaccines searching for arms. Um, when the, since, we, since we last talked, actually this dropped after the meeting, um, but what happened with the J&J &J vaccine? There was a meeting Friday, April 23rd. Um, I asked uh, my partners to cover so I could listen to this. Um, that just raises my geek factor, I guess, that I wanted to listen to this all day. Um, <clears throat> but a summary um, came out. So we saw published April 27th in the MMWR updated recommendations from the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices for the use of the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson, COVID-19 vaccine after reports of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome among vaccine recipients, United States, April 2021. So in brief, um, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices concluded that the risks of resuming Janssen COVID-19 vaccination among persons aged equal to or greater than 18 outweighed the risks and reaffirmed its interim recommendation under the FDA's emergency use authorization, um, but included a new warning for rare clotting events among women aged 18 to 49 for this thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome or TTS as we'll be referring to it, or as other people refer to it as VITS, vaccine induced um, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. So what, what did we know? What did we learn from this publication and from the meeting? Um, nearly 8 million, so 7.98 million doses of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine um, had been administered in the United States and the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, so VAERS, um, received at the end of this prior to this meeting, 15 reports of the TTS after vaccinations. Um, with the clots located, I think this is important, in the cerebral venous sinuses and other unusual locations, including the portal vein, the splenic vein, and a combination of venous and arterial thromboses. Um, these 15 reports were confirmed by physician reviewers at the CDC and the FDA. Um, they went through and reviewed this, including um, having hematologists involved in the review. 13 of the cases occurred among women aged 18 to 49. Two occurred among women aged 50 or older. And no cases post authorization reported among men. Remember, there was a man in the trial, um, <clears throat> but he was not in this 15 uh, person study here. So the, the TTS reporting rates um, were seven cases per million. 
Um, and the Janssen COVID-19 vaccines were administered to um, 18 to 49. We had 0 0.9 per million in the aged greater than 50 years. And then they broke it down into to different subgroups, which I'll go through actually. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna jump to, I'm gonna give John Hitt some credit here. John Hitt at United Health Group actually made some tables for me. Um, wasn't really for me, they're for the whole group, our sort of uh, national vaccine advisory panel. Um, but what were the race, what were the cases of TTS per million vaccinations broken down by age, right? So um, all age groups, 1.87. If we looked at people under 50, it was seven per million. Over 50, it was 0 0.9. Um, and then you can break it down into other age groups as well. Then there was the other, and this came up, were there certain comorbid, comorbid conditions or maybe certain medications that we should be thinking about? What about obesity? Um, seven of the 12 had obesity, eight did not. What about oral contraception? Two were on oral contraception, 13 were not. Hypothyroid two, hypertension two, no recent pregnancies. Interesting enough, no history of prior clotting disorders in this population. So um, at the end at the end of the report, and I'm going to sort of even make some comments here, they basically went ahead and they said, okay, we are going to put this back out there. We're going to put a warning on there and we're going to allow this to be a patient um, decision ultimately. And I have to admit, when I've talked to a lot of physicians about this, not all of them were as excited as I should say I was. Um, and, and I think this is interesting, right? Um, physicians like to be the ones who get to make decisions. Um, and so here, here we're basically saying, no, the patient will get the right. Certain physicians say, I would feel better if we did not use this vaccine in women under the age of 50. Um, and I think that really take it as it is, they're saying that's not the physician's decision. Here are the facts, it's the patient's decision. And we're actually maybe starting to move into a realm where before we said, take whatever vaccine you have the opportunity to take. Now we're starting to see patients have preferences based on certain things. Patient the other day, uh, this was a woman in her 40s. Um, she had a prior history of a pulmonary embolism. Um, we had a discussion and she was suggesting to me that she would prefer to do a Moderna over the J&J &J vaccine. I think that that's completely reasonable. Um, if we're looking at challenges with getting more vaccine uptake, giving people choice, letting them have agency, I think that that's more important than physicians getting to have the final say on everything here. We continue to have our vaccines against the variants race, or what I like to call vaccines against the variants of concern, as well as behaviors of concern. Um, and we actually got two, what I think are encouraging preprints uh, that became available about the New York variant. Um, it's nice that we have our own variant. Um, B1526, SARS-CoV-2 variant identified in New York City, um, neutralized by vaccine elicited and therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. Um, and that was available um, on, uh, as a preprint. Um, we also had detection and characterization of the SARS-CoV-2 lineage, B1526 in New York. Now, basically both papers demonstrated that vaccine serum showed a little bit of a decrease, but remained at an elevated and protective level. Convalescent plasma did not fare as well. Um, the monoclonal cocktail by Regeneron continued to be effective. I think the take home message here was that the vaccines still work against the variants. Um, don't count on um, protection after natural infection quite as much as counting on the protection that we get with vaccination. All right, the period of detectable viral replication, right? You test positive. Um, this is the time for monitoring and monoclonals so far. Um, I think it's important that although this, um, this may not impact our daily clinician as physicians, um, we do pay attention to what's happening around the world. Um, maybe it will swing back, maybe it will affect us, but I think it's also important for us to be aware of what's going on. Um, so there was an article, the global case fatality rate of COVID-19 has been declining since May 2020, published in the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene Journal. Um, so, so what's happening here? Uh, so the authors collected daily COVID-19 diagnoses and mortality data from the WHO's daily situation reports and reported that based on this data, the weekly global cumulative COVID-19 reported case fatality rate. So that's that R 
CFR. Um, I feel like we're going back when we were first learning about the difference between case fatality rate and reported case fatality rate. So these are cases reported. We, we have it documented that this is COVID-19. Um, what percent of those individuals die? We know that the actual case fatality rate is probably higher, um, where the actual infection fatality rate is probably higher. But we reached a peak of 7.23% um, in the last week of April, April 22 to 28 in 2020, right? So it's right about a year ago. This was followed by a strong declining trend up until um, the 53rd week, post peak, like right after this peak. Um, we ended up down at 2.2% um, in the last week of December, 2020. Now, why did this happen? And they had a couple suggestions, right? So that, that's the data. Um, they suggested that part of this um, was an increased rate of infection in younger individuals, right? We know that younger individuals have a lower uh, case fatality rate. Um, they also um, looked at a map of regional reported case fatality rates. Um, so Yemen, for instance, where I believe Dixon likes to go salmon fishing, they had a reported case fatality rate of 30% um, April through December of 2020. While by comparison, right, the reported case fatality rate overall in the US is 2% for all cases with an outcome. So um, I recommend people take a look. It's worth looking at the different figures and seeing what's happened over time. I keep saying this is the time for monitoring and monoclonals, but I'm hoping that this will change. We keep hearing from Pfizer that by the end of the year, they're, they're promising us an oral COVID pill. Um, now, now what, do we, what do we know about this? They're talking about a phase one study of a very catchy PF0732132. So what, what, what is this and what do we know? Um, little background here. So SARS-CoV-2 produces two large viral polyproteins. These are really long proteins that are going to need to be chopped up. So PP1A and PP1AB. And these are processed by two virally encoded cysteine proteases. Now, the main protease, protease, is also called 3C-like protease, um, so 3CL protease or 3CL pro, and there's a papain-like protease. Um, so we initially heard about this product um, or targeting this um, with an intravenous preparation. It was PF00835231. There'll be a test at the end. Um, this was a preprint back in February entitled Discovery of a Novel Inhibitor of Coronavirus 3CL Protease for the Potential Treatment of COVID-19. Um, and now Pfizer is suggesting that they'll have the other catchy PF0732-1332 um, on the market by the end of this year they have started a phase one trial, right? So that's hopefully we're going to have more tools. Um, we also um, have been hearing um, from Merck and Ridgeback Biopharmaceuticals that they've been working on malnupiravir. And this is a different, different way, a different small molecule uh, potential oral pill uh, that can be used as an antiviral. This is a ribonucleoside analog um, that they have found inhibits replication of multiple RNA viruses. So this is something they've been working with for a while. Um, people who are familiar with HIV and AIDS treatment, think of this much like AZT, um, where you're getting one of those building blocks of the RNA. So an, uh, an A, a C, a G, or a U, we target all these in HIV, and you replace one of these with an analog, which then gets brought in and interferes with the virus replication. Um, as we find out more about this, I will certainly share that information. All right, so let us finish off here with the tail phase, long COVID or post COVID. Um, and I think I'm going to call this, it is not just about long COVID. Um, so early on, I fought against this narrow view um, what people thought about COVID, the you're either going to live or you die, and that's the end of it. Um, still, still, unfortunately, here to this day from physicians, um, just sort of this idea that people who are suffering, oh, it's all in their head. Um, but I think people are now appreciating, many more people are appreciating um, that it can be a lot more than two weeks um, once COVID gets into your system, so to speak. Um, but there's also an appreciation that maybe there's something more than even just long COVID. And I think this is a little discouraging, but um, in nature, there was the article 
high dimensional characterization of post-acute sequelae of COVID-19. Now, what is this about? So the authors in this article used the national healthcare databases of the U.S. Departments of Veterans Affairs to systematically and comprehensively identify six-month incident sequelae, including diagnoses, medication use, laboratory abnormalities in 30-day survivors of COVID-19. All right, so this is a really robust um, database. This cohort was 5,808,018 participants. Um, and so this, this is a really robust um, data set that they were looking at. Um, and within those alive, um, they were looking at the COVID-19 group selected um, having a COVID-19 test um, that was positive before March 1st, 2020 and November 30, or between, I should say, between March 1st, 2020 and November 30th, 2020. So in this large set, they had found almost 100,000 individuals, um, and then they're gonna look at these individuals. And what did, what did they find? So this study identified a significant increase in problems in this population that affected the respiratory system, the nervous system, neurocognitive disorders, mental health disorders, metabolic disorders, cardiovascular disorders, gastrointestinal disorders, malaise, fatigue, musculoskeletal pain, anemia. Um, this population had an increased use of um, many medications, particularly pain medications, opioids, non-opioids, antidepressants, anxiolytics, antihypertensives, oral hypoglycemics, um, and they had evidence of laboratory abnormality, abnormalities in multiple organ systems. Um, so what I think I'm gonna just really point out here is that this analysis is suggesting that even people who do not identify or get classified as long COVID, there's really a lot of outcomes um, in addition that we're seeing are an increased incidence. Um, and this is actually worth looking at this paper, I will say, it's available, Nature. Um, there's actually a gradation, right? So non-hospitalized, hospitalized, admitted to the ICU, the more severe your COVID, um, the higher incidence we were seeing of all these different um, disorders, right? So I think that we're seeing elevation in the non-hospitalized as well, but increasing with more severity of disease. So I'm going to finish up on that note. And we are switching. When this drops, it will be May 1st. Um, thank you, everyone who supported the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Um, we are now going to support Foundation International Medical Relief of Children again. This is going to be a three-month campaign. Um, to be honest, they're struggling, right? This is an organization that is supported um, through volunteers, um, younger individuals, excited about global health, signing up, um, contributing, going to all these parts of the world. Um, they need our help. They need your help. So take a moment, go to parasiteswithoutborders.com um, and help us support them. We're going to do the same thing we've done before. We're going to double those donations. We're going to try to get up to $40,000 to support FEMREC. And we're going to do this over the next three months. So help us. Time for some email for Daniel. If you want to send one, daniel at microbe.tv. Sarah in Tallahassee writes, are the monoclonal antibody therapies appropriate for patients who have already been vaccinated? So that's a great question. We are certainly giving monoclonals to people that have already been vaccinated, um, or I should word it, we are not restricting them. We are not um, taking a person who's vaccinated, not allowing them to have the monoclonals. And there's a couple of reasons here. One, if you think about it, there's usually something going on when a person has a breakthrough infection. And we've certainly seen people, they get vaccinated and then they go ahead and they get exposed. It's really sort of straightforward if they just got the vaccine, um, but we're seeing people, it might be weeks out. Some people, particularly our older um, members of our society, people with certain immune issues, they may not have the ability to develop that robust immune system. We're going ahead. We're seeing good experiences um, as we get more numbers. Um, I think we actually closed one of my studies, so hopefully we'll be getting some data out there um, showing, demonstrating what's the efficacy in different populations, including this particular population. All right, we have a letter from Mike, who is an infectious disease physician in Tacoma. In your most recent clinical update, 747, you mentioned in your reply to the retired health and safety professional listeners question as to why authorities are not recommending N95 respirators to the public 
that you would recommend such masks in certain high-risk situations or high-risk environments. You then relayed your own story of how you recommended to your family members to wear KN95 masks when they flew on an airplane. The listener mentioned that he thought the KN95 Chinese masks available to him locally were likely made of similar materials and of similar quality to the 3M N95s. When they first came out, I was initially confused by the different KN95 designation on the respirators that were advertised from overseas and have been following the U.S. government's evaluation of these masks since the time. Unfortunately, such U.S. government testing has revealed that the overseas KN95 testing standards for such overseas masks have not been rigorously quality control. Many did not reliably come close to 95% uh, filtration efficiency. And Mike provides a CDC link to a report on these masks. Thus, in the interest of being fully transparent to the listener who wrote in and to the public, I would suggest that KN95 respirators may provide you with more protection against SARS-CoV-2 than a cloth mask, but are overall not as quality controlled and would suggest the listener and public consult the above web, web link for more information. That is excellent. So thank you so much. You know, I, I always like to point out that this is not really a one-man show um, and stuff like this is super helpful. I'm starting to feel like should I have shared one of my N95s or two of them with my daughter and my wife, but no, this is really well taken. And I, I think that as we go forward, you know, I, I'm actually surprised at this point that we don't have better certification. You know, you get a mask and it's got a certain stamp or a certain, you know, we, we have certifications for organic food where the certifications to help us with masks, which which actually are keeping us safe and uh, saving lives. So, no, excellent point, everyone. Um, I'm glad that this was sent in. We have a, an, an email from Vincent, who is an, uh, also a physician. Uh, two questions. I recently immunized a 49-year-old lady who has a history of Parkinson's and an active left septic bursitis with J&J. &J. Should I have left held off due to her bursitis or was I right in doing so? Let's take that one first, Daniel. So you did the right thing. Never miss an opportunity to immunize it. I'm hoping you didn't put the immunization in that bursa, right? Maybe you did the other arm. That would make a little sense. <laughs> I got a question earlier today. Um, and actually it was about, you know, every so often we see people, you know, we've got people doing vaccines that maybe have never done them before. And they're somehow they get it in the bursa, which is actually usually a challenge, right? Because we're trying to learn to do that for other reasons. But, um, you know, Try not to get it in the bursa. Um, do the other side if someone has bursitis. If they get it in the bursa, probably still going to get, you know, the, we, we hope you're still going to get the protection. Um, I think it would make sense that you will. Um, but no, I don't think something like a bursitis, um, we really have to be careful, not let little things keep us from getting a person vaccinated. So I think you did the right thing. Now, hopefully I laid out the risks with J&J &J really small. Yeah, and then his next question is about J&J. &J. Does it stand to reason to treat with aspirin prophylactically or just wait it out? Yeah, so when, when and I've actually had this conversation with a lot of clinicians, so it really is an excellent, it's a good question. Um, if you start doing the risk benefit, um, and this was interesting, right? I started asking people, so what if you tell someone to take an aspirin every day? You know, 1% of those people will have a GI bleed within the year, right? We didn't pull aspirin off the market when that happened. Um, you are better off doing nothing, um, you know, first do no harm. Um, you are more likely to cause problems um, to someone after a J&J &J than you're gonna provide any help by throwing aspirin or anything at them. So go ahead, get them vaccinated. And then if they have a severe headache, that one in a million, we'll pick it up, we'll treat them properly. All right, one more from Chris. In your recent clinical update, you said, responsible summer camp should be doing testing because there's funding for it now. I'm on the board of a summer camp. This is good news, but I can't find any information. Can you please point to more information about this? Okay. I'm going to actually, um, I'm going to say this slowly because we'll, we'll be uh, giving this person a bunch of emails, hopefully. Um, I've been working with a woman, Phoebe, for about the last year, uh, helping promote access to and uh, coordination for particularly rapid testing, but testing in general as a solution. And so um, Phoebe has worked with the rapidtesting.org, also worked with a lot of different foundations um, and actually uh, did a lot to push for funding in these bills. So I can give her a little credit for that. Now, um, I asked Phoebe um, previously and she said yes, that I could share when people had questions like this. So her email is P-O-L 
H-A-V-A at gmail.com. Um, if you're a summer camp, if you're looking for ways to get access to testing, um, shoot her an email. She's she's not in this to make any money. I think she must make money as a radiologist or something. Um, she's just there to help um, doing all these efforts pro bono. So um, reach out. Let's, let's make sure that that money actually is spent, that that testing keeps our kids safe. That's COVID-19 clinical update number 60 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you so much. And everyone be safe.